Production of a film has been fairly straightforward since cinema's inception. The script is developed, the movie is shot, then follows editing, post-production and distribution. Sometimes a movie would flop because a director couldn't visualize during production what the visual effects would add in post. Other times, complex directorial visions mixed with natural disasters would put productions in limbo. Virtual production wants to change that. Virtual production uses a suite of software tools to combine live action footage and computer graphics in real time, allowing filmmakers to follow their vision from the start independent of shooting locations. Productions can now use LED walls to recreate a whole set, combining physical and virtual elements through a game engine. Virtual reality, augmented reality and CGI can immediately be captured on set. John Favreau was one of the visionaries behind this technology. So lifelike, he considered his Lion King remake a live-action film, despite it being fully animated. Favreau pushed the tech further with The Mandalorian, shooting 50% of the first season on these digital sets. After its success, the amount of productions using this method doubled in 2020. The COVID-19 pandemic accelerated its growth since companies had to limit cast and crew on set and couldn't travel to some locations, turning to VFX techniques and remote editing. It's estimated that five years from now, with a new workforce grown up working in interactive environments such as these, virtual production will have been completely normalized in the entertainment business. Independent films will also benefit from this revolution, lowering production costs, making more sustainable projects, and reducing cinema's carbon footprint. Virtual production will open new boundaries for creativity. But at what cost? New jobs will be created, expanded, others will be lost. The tactile will disappear even more than it has already, replaced by the virtual, by the boundless imagination of creators. Will everyone be ready to embark on this journey to the future? Hello and welcome to the Future Film Conference for the session, The Virtual Production Revolution is Coming. So uh, we already had a nice introduction um, that uh, gave some glimpses of what is about to come. Um, I'm Björn Stockleben, Professor of New Media Production uh, at Film University Babelsberg in Germany. I will be your host for this session. And we have uh, three guests today. It's uh, Alex Stolz. He is a senior executive consultant broadcaster specialized in the nexus between film and innovation. That's why he founded the future of film as a podcast community and a global summit to bring innovation to the film business. And recently he worked with uh, the London-based Garden Studios um, to develop their virtual production processes. We have uh, Johannes Wilke from uh, Glassbox Technologies based in Northern Germany, not far from the place where I origin from, uh, originate from, oh, sorry. Um, the, they work on uh, virtual production tools uh, for uh, Unreal Engine, and uh, he will talk a bit about uh, the current status, state of the art in virtual production software. And we will have Jamie Mosahebi from Epic Games uh, London Innovation Lab. And uh, he is a virtual production producer and constantly working to create the most powerful and free virtual production platform in the world. So um, the session will run like uh, everybody will give an input of five to 10 minutes. Then uh, we will have a discussion led by myself and you are then free to chip in questions. Actually, right now uh, when they are talking, just, um, um, just put it in the chat if you have any questions and uh, I will sort and uh, put the questions forwards to uh, our guests. Um, yeah, then I would like uh, Alex to open uh, the session with uh, the first presentation. Yeah, hello everyone, welcome. Um, thank you very much for, for joining. Um, I'm excited to, 
to be here. Uh, so yes, I um, head up Future of Film, which is uh, started as a, a podcast, um, which you can find on all your your favourite podcast platforms. Um, and uh, we also have a, a, a global summit every year, um, and and a report. And and the uh, my short presentation this morning uh, is is gleaned mostly from our most recent report uh, which has a big focus on virtual production. Um, this is our vision of a future of film. Uh, we are, we, this is what we're trying to move towards, we're trying to encourage, we're trying to inspire. Uh, so we want a future that is inclusive, sustainable and rewards courageous storytelling. And we think virtual production has got a huge part to play in this future. Um, it's a very exciting technology, it's a very exciting process. And um, it really is, we, we believe it can unlock a lot, of, uh, a lot of the things we're talking about, you know, in terms of sustainability, inclusivity, uh, and new voices of storytelling coming through. Um, uh, yeah, and this is just a little bit more about some of the activity that we do uh, and the reports, which you can download um, for free at futureoffilm.live. Uh, so what is virtual production? Well, there is no one definition. This is, this is, one, of the, uh, this is one of the challenges, right? There's no, uh, there's no unified definition. Some people, to some people, virtual production means doing stuff uh, remotely. Uh, to others, virtual production has been happening for decades because it is uh, it, it, it's really about creating an illusion um, on camera of, um, of, of uh, as, as visual effects on camera. And that could be literally you know, going back to the, uh, the, the old uh, you know, 1950s movies with the, the rear projection uh, behind the, the, the car scene. Um, which always looks a little bit dodgy, but it's that, you know, it has that same, um, same principles or, or similar principles. Um, but to us, it's the real-time game engine, which is the distinct, distinctive factor. Um, so we, we define virtual production as filmmaking that uses real-time game engines to capture final visual effects in camera. And, uh, and obviously, you know, we're talking about Unreal Engine, um, we're talking about Unity, and there, there are other engines out there. But they're, uh, Unreal are really the leaders in this space right now. Uh, here's a quote from uh, one of our favorite people, Felix from a Happy Mushroom, who are real leaders in this space. And I love this quote because people call it virtual production, but in the future it's just gonna be called filmmaking. These are techniques which are being integrated into the, the process. Um, and we'll, we'll come along, come on to a little bit of that. This is obviously just a, a short presentation before we come on to that more in the discussion. Um, but it's, uh, well, so I guess, I guess at the one end of the spectrum, you have the, the Mandalorian, right? You have, you have these spectacular uh, stages um, and there's the inset there is, is of Mank, actually, the, the black and white David Fincher film, which used virtual production techniques as well um, during, the, during the shoot. You have, you have that sort of on, uh, on stage, on screen, um, high end level of virtual production. Uh, and these stages are popping up around, around the, the, the place now. They're not just located um you know at ilm they are now opening up this is the garden studios which um they all mentioned at the beginning this is a, a new setup in london uh and people are figuring this out it's very nascent technology um and it's it's there's no <laughs> there's no sort of there's no textbook yet on how to to set up a, a, an led stage but this is the this is the thing. This is why I I think it's truly exciting. 
because it's you know you, you, it's very exciting to think that you can shoot something on an LED stage and you can put a background in there um, and the real-time engine can manipulate that background it's incredible because wherever you move the camera the backgrounds can respond to that um, and, and you create this illusion of depth it's 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 quite a, you know it's, it's magical but what I think is really exciting about virtual production is it changes the process of collaboration changes the process of filmmaking um, this is a uh, a schematic from Unity, and it shows. It is. I think it's, it's quite helpful because it really shows that it's a different process. It's been said that virtual production allows um, production designers to become to influence the project. It allows cinematographers to become more influential in the project. It allows um, costume designers to do the same. And lighting, cameras. It's um, because you're able to set this up at a much earlier stage. Um, in fact, it, it's really important that you do. Um, the, the whole process of virtual production starts in pre-production. Um, and what you're, instead of having one person decide what they think is gonna be the vision and everyone has, has to sort of, you know, join at a later stage, it can be uh, a much more collaborative process. Um, that brings a whole load of new challenges, whole new load of workflow um, challenges. And um, this is the exciting thing. I think this is, a, is very much a, a new way of making films, but it doesn't, it, it's not all perfect. It doesn't come without risks um, and it doesn't come without challenges. Um, I also wanted to mention uh, this, which is real-time animation. This is, this is maybe not virtual production, um, but it's very, very closely related. Um, and it's obviously the relation is, is of course, all with the, the engine, you know, the game engine, Unreal Engine. And this is where you're really seeing some democratization in the technology because you don't need the big LED stage for this, right? You just need um, some, uh, you know, high high end laptops and uh, and a remote team, and there's an amazing work happening in this space. It is completely global. It's completely it's without borders, um, and the possibility, you know, the, the quality that these artists can get using this technology is huge. So I wanted to just mention that as where I think there's there's real you know, in the animation space, it's very exciting. Um, but where, where's, this, where's all this going? Uh, I just wrap up, you know, it's always good to wrap up with a, the slide of the matrix. Um, filmmaking never goes backwards. I love that quote from one of our participants at the summit last year. And if you think about what's happening with, in the animation space, um, you can uh, it, w sort of the, the way that is heading is that you, you know you're going to be able to shoot films in these virtual worlds, um, and that's uh, that's John Gator's one of our, our participants, and he designed the he's designed Bullet Time and stuff on the Matrix. That's his th thought of where things are going, um, and I think we're going to see some really crazy stuff <laughs> happening using these techniques, using game engines. Um, and sort of collaboration. So that's that's a little sort of some some thoughts um, on virtual production and from from our perspective at uh, Future of Film. And that's where you can download our report. Thanks, Alex. Thanks a lot, uh, um, especially about the. Uh, we'll have to talk about uh, the new collaboration process and uh, uh, definitely also about the democratization process of this new technology. Now let's dive a bit deeper into how this is implemented with uh, the presentation by uh, Johannes. So, um, hi, I'm Johannes Wilke. I'm executive producer at Glassbox Technologies. And I thought I'd talk to you about um, as a bit of a case study of our experience, what it takes to democratize virtual cameras as part of virtual production. 
So for context, Glassbox was founded in early 2016 through the coming together of our co-founders who are veterans from the two worlds of film and game engine technology respectively with the goal of creating game engine centric virtual production tools that are accessible to both large studios but also individual creators alike. And so to look at democratization of virtual production tools, I think we need to look at what it takes to adopt working with these tools. And over the years, we've collaborated with leading Hollywood visualization studios, but we've also received a lot of input from boutique studios and individual creators. And this wide spectrum of users is what I want to take a close look at today. Uh, because I think it's fair to say that there is definitely a gap in how accessible these tools are to creators and studios of different sizes right now. But at the same time, I think um, that in relevant areas, everyone's actually facing uh, and overcoming fairly similar challenges. So in that sense, I think the gap between large and small studio users is a lot narrower than uh, some people assume. And if you aren't convinced, then that's what I'll try and show you over the next few minutes. Um, as an example, I'll use Dragonfly, which is one of our tools. I think that um, illustrates um, the point really nicely. Uh, Dragonfly is our virtual camera solution. So it allows you to create shots and camera paths exactly like you would use a real world physical camera. So with Dragonfly, you're using a screen that is motion tracked in space and effectively becomes your virtual viewport that you can use to record footage, for example, in Unreal Engine. And Dragonfly first came to be when in 2016, uh, we were working with the third floor to basically distill the best practices at the time into a set of products that could be used by large customers, but again, also by a broader audience. And at the same, at the time, I think it's fair to say that there, are, there were three main issues with virtual production. Uh, tools were bespoke, every studio using them had their own, uh, which made them extremely expensive. And they also relied on extensive hardware. And then even in high budget productions outside of previous, virtual production simply wasn't something that everyone had a clear understanding of. Uh, luckily, since then, uh, some of these um, issues have seen improvements in some areas, but to an extent, all of these are also still around. So, Coming from workflows established by and for large productions, what's different for smaller productions? Uh, firstly, let's take a look at some concrete requirements of large productions that have informed these products. Um, when motion tracking is involved, accuracy uh, can be really important. Uh, more, accurate, more accurate tracking data means cleaner recordings, means uh, less work in post, or the ability to use the technology in live environments like broadcasting. And this can also include thinking about the data management size, since, for example, the sheer size of scenes can easily become a challenge. Uh, you might also want to integrate these new tools into existing pipelines and workflows, which can add complications. And this can also include uh, uh, banal things like just making sure that technology is usable for film crews, for example, who have only worked with traditional equipment before. Or similarly, you might have specific hardware requirements. Um, those can be as simple as um, can we have a second viewport for the director, but they can also be more arcane, like, well, we have this robotic arm, can we attach the VCAM controller to that and control it that way, right? And all of this can make virtual production expensive very quickly. But then if we think about this from the perspective of smaller studios or creators, a lot of this actually becomes more flexible. I mean, if you don't have access to a high fidelity optical motion tracking system, you can often get away with just doing more takes or spending a bit more time in cleanup. Uh, most people are probably not live streaming, so you can do things sequentially rather than live, which significantly uh, reduces complexity. First, you do your live action, facial animation mocap, then do virtual camera work, etc. And in, in small productions, pipeline can be simpler and more flexible, making adoption of this technology easier. And then also you probably won't have a robotic arm that you need to integrate to begin with. So 
I think while there are certainly differences in requirements, here there isn't really a blanket barrier of entry for smaller productions that I can see. So let's look at this differently and talk about barriers that do exist. What are the main challenges in adopting virtual production? First of all, obviously, I think the largest one is simply missing know-how. And this is something that often feels like a big hurdle, especially to individual creators. However, I think um, we must acknowledge that this is also uh, real for large studios. I mean, true, a large chunk of the human subject knowledge in this area is, of course, concentrated in large productions right now. But within these productions, there are still a lot of people that are also totally new to this and need to be educated on, on this just the same. And now um, that there's starting to be a lot more educational material on virtual production, getting started really becomes doable for anyone. Uh, then, of course, there is a financial barrier. And that's, of course, very real. I mean, as a solo creator, you probably won't start building your own LED stage in your flat anytime soon. But then again, not all of virtual production requires an LED stage. There's a lot you can do um, and that becomes accessible with really basic equipment like a PC, um, a phone, an iPad, maybe an inexpensive uh, tracking system like a Vive Puck, uh, things like that, right? So let's get back to our case study, Dragonfly, to illustrate what I'm talking about. Um, in this picture, we see what Dragonfly looked like originally, running on a specialty rig, motion tracked by an OptiTrack system. And that's not really something everyone has access to. But then very quickly, it became clear that while this is a great solution technically, even in large productions, there are issues with this because for some directors coming from traditional film, spending days at a motion capture volume just wasn't something that they were interested in. So, uh, what, what do you do in that case? Well, our answer was um, we put uh, the same software Dragonfly connected to a game engine on an iPad. And this is something that is very familiar um, to everyone. It's very non-threatening, very accessible, and also uh, comes with motion tracking built in. And I think this is one great example of a change that really wasn't so much driven by budget pressure or anything like that, but it has made uh, VCAM work significantly cheaper and therefore more accessible. And then uh, since then, a bunch of features that we've added to Dragonfly really followed the same path of being required in large scale productions, but adding so much value for small ones as well. Here are just a few examples. Um, we're supporting any tracking source. So Anything that you can get moving in engines, you can use as your virtual camera driver. Um, we have super customizable button bindings. So if you're not a two person team, you can easily make this work um, as, as one person as well, just by customizing how you interact with the tool. And if you don't even have a hardware controller, so you're really just using the, your iPad, then our companion app also acts as a touch screen controller that gives you all the buttons that you might want to use for customization. Um, so really, at this point, a laptop and an iPad will allow you to create incredible virtual cinematography that just wouldn't have been possible not too long ago. And again, if it feels like there is a barrier in terms of cost and ability for adoption, I think um, with every advancement that's made on large productions, the good news is that part of that trickles down and makes these techni techniques viable for smaller productions. Um, and this is a process that's, that has been going on for some time now. To the point where, for us, um, though we of course continue to work with larger clients, highlighting how these tools are ready for every type of user now has become a bit of a calling. Uh, so to close with, I thought I'd um, share with you an excerpt of a video that we produced when Dragonfly uh, came out of beta originally that I think highlights this point very well. The first thing we hear about virtual production is that it's hard. And at Glassbox, we're about creating professional tools with consumer accessibility that really streamlines and simplifies your virtual production workflow. 
The issue with existing virtual camera solutions is that they tend to be on the two extremes. They are either highly specialized and tailored to the need of particular crews and particular teams and particular workflows, or they're very generic, such that people need to invest a lot more time and effort and specialize it for their use. Dragonfly cuts through tens of thousands of dollars of software and equipment costs and puts the power of real-time virtual cameras onto consumer hardware. You have an iPad and anyone can get access to an iPad. Second, we've got the, the joystick controllers on there, so you just do a little beepity boopity flippity flop and you already have where you need to go, what you need to do. It's actually really easy to use. When you say we're going to do virtual production and you just take out a laptop, a travel router and an iPad, and you're literally doing virtual production in a hotel room or by the pool. You can start recording, you can start taking snapshots, you can start doing bookmarks, and you really don't need anything else. We designed Dragonfly to give people that are new to virtual production a useful tool that works out of the box, but also for people that have a lot of experience in this area to be able to take it and plug it straight into their pipeline. It's plug and play. You don't need anything. You can basically just start using it and start shooting. It's tough to overstate how incredible this is and what it means to content creators like myself, having that flexibility and having the ability to set it up and run it with just a single person means that we can experiment. We can be a lot more creative in how we approach our work. Yeah, so hope that Made sense. Um, for more information, um, the, that you can find on glassboxtech.com. And looking forward to all questions that come later. Thanks a lot. Then let's uh, close the presentation session with uh, Jamie, who will talk a bit about uh, the engine behind most of those productions, uh, Unreal, and uh, what are you doing to innovate and fuel virtual production around the world? The screen is yours. Great, fantastic. Uh, nice to meet you all um, and thanks for joining. I've just put together a short presentation where I can chat through, um, as explained, um, the Unreal Engine and how it's contributing to uh, the development of virtual production. Um, so as some of you may be familiar, um, Unreal Engine is uh, one of the most popular game engines, the majority of AAA games um, for console are built in Unreal. Um, the engine itself um, is used for lots of things, um, not simply just gaming. Um, it's one platform that can be used to output for still images, linear output, virtual production, interactive experiences, immersive experiences, uh, AR and mixed reality. Um, where my focus is in the London lab is non-gaming media and entertainment. So that would suggest that um, virtual production is a, a key part of that. Um, I'm just going to full screen that so it's a bit. Um, so, what do we mean by virtual production? The most common uh, use of the term is what is known as in camera VFX, uh, although it's quite a lot more than that. Um, so, made quite popular by The Mandalorian, um, in camera VFX is using tracked cameras, um, tracked in engine of digital environments, and then projecting that to an LED wall, which is then uh, reframed and distorted so it looks correct for the camera. And then the captured camera walks away with an in-camera VFX shot. Um, I have a short little sizzle reel. Can you hear that okay? really one of the early adopters for virtual production here in the southeast and we got excited about the technology because of the future of what it can be. Ce que permet ce nouvel outil c'est de donner de nouveaux moyens créatifs aux clients afin de pouvoir projeter leur production dans des univers qui jusqu'à présent étaient inatteignables en live. Also das ist natürlich beeindruckend was man hier sehen kann. Das ist euh... Ich würde sagen, die Perfektionierung der Zukunft, das Know-how und dieser Digitalisierungsvariante, ist das einfach ein neues Drehen. Que no final da diária você acaba saindo é, possivelmente com material praticamente finalizado, onde você não precisa consertar nada.
We're only scraping the surface of what this technology can do. The benefits are countless. And the day will finally come when we all will say, green screen, your services are no longer required. Orca Studios is a Spanish-based company specialized in an integral solution Hi. for filmmaking. My name is Alex Daki, I'm a single frame figure in Milan, Italy, and I'm a single frame figure in Milan, Italy, and One of the reasons I like that sizzle reel, and I think you guys may have noticed, is that um, it shows the varying different scales at which virtual production is being used. Um, so The Mandalorian a couple of years ago was a really exciting, you know, AAA gaming equivalent of, of how these studios are using it for mainstream film and TV. And that's still happening. Um, every major studio from Netflix to Amazon has invested in large scale LED volumes. Um, but on top of that, you're starting to see indie studios um, you're starting to see it used in music videos, advertising, automotive commercials, and many of them are on much smaller um, scale stages. Um, they're certainly not small, small. Um, they're just much more practical and they're often located in more practical places. Um, so it really is something, a technology that's spanning um, very much from Hollywood uh, to the indie studios. Um, I also um, quite like uh, this slide from, you know, I'm a, I'm a producer by, by trade um, and we've been producing some content at the London lab um, and you're starting to see the traditional, very linear pipeline of filmmaking be disrupted a little bit. Um, in, the, in that sense, we're moving a lot of the tasks from post-production uh, into pre-production. Um, so you're, you're getting people, departments shifting in terms of like art department, which are now becoming a, a virtual art department. This is quite efficient actually, because what you're finding is a lot of people in say set design were already using 3D tools to visualize uh, set builds, um, but it was often quite throwaway work. Um, what we're doing now is we're white boxing sets. Um, and then rather that being shipped out to being built, um, it's being shipped out to a, a digital team and some of the projects we've been working on um, they're building those sets in Unreal, they get used in a VP shoot, and they're also being repurposed for video games, um, for further adjustments to the set, for sequels and things like that. So it's becoming a really um, efficient pipeline um, of how, how film and TV work. One of the things I, I have mentioned as I joined as well, because it's something, um, a particular interest area of mine, is just not just to focus on in-camera VFX, but when we talk about virtual production, we're also talking about animation too. Um, so this is a clip um, which uh, Epic worked on with Weta um, that shows off some of the, the animation tools and rendering. everything you saw there was rendered in Unreal um, and I think with animation you're really starting to see how originally that uh, doing animation in gaming 
Um, also, I think a common misconception is that um, Unreal is focused solely on photorealistic work. Um, we also get some animations that studios are working on across Europe and in the US that very much stylized look and feel. Um, and it's really exciting to see that span of um, styles and quality. So I think although tracked cameras and LED walls um, aren't involved, there's very much a virtual production uh, element to all the animation work as well. Some of the products that are being used, um, you guys may be familiar with Crystal Megascans, which is now part of the Epic family. Um, this is, these are all photorealistic assets and textures that are available for free um, for anyone using Unreal Engine. Um, the Quixel team is still actively out in the world, climbing mountains, uh, taking photos of things, <laughs> um, and very much uh, scanning the world. They all come Unreal Engine ready with different levels of detail um, and uh, are, are really useful in terms of uh, building your project. Super um, quick video of Megascans, uh, Bridge and Mixer, um, which are the tools used for um, creating what is hosted on the website. So hopefully you can see there how useful um, that can be in creating digital spaces when you can create um, uh, real world materials uh, that are physically accurate. I'm conscious of time because I want to make sure we have questions. Um, I want to just add another tool in there, which is MetaHuman Creator. Um, there's a really nice trailer on this, but you can check it out online. Um, this is a web based tool for creating uh, digitally accurate humans. Um, you can adapt your human um, and it was specifically built um for creating background artists and things like that these are starting to be tested in icvfx shoots too so it's um certainly the most cost effective way and it's a free tool um of, of building, building realistic digital humans that come rigged and ready to use number uh lastly I'll just skip that. finally we have the virtual production field guide which was recently updated so this is available free online if you just um, search on the epic website we've got the link to and it's lots of uh interviews and really handy information on virtual production um, from experts in the industry like this panel um and it's a really useful uh, insight to where we're at um so yeah i really look forward to having your guys questions i'll stop there and then i can share stuff if they pop up in the questions so where well, we've got that 15 minutes ago so thank you very much thanks a lot jamie no for your presentation. So um, there's, there's really a, a rich reservoir a repertoire of, of stuff that people can use to start a, uh, working right away with Unreal and virtual production. So that's, that's really a fantastic what, range of tools you provided there. Um, I'd like to come to another slide of yours that also uh, Alex mentioned that the change of the production uh, process, how does it evolve? How does it change? And maybe, um, maybe uh, we start with Alex. Um, could you think of a moment, an event, an example where, where you realize, wow, now this, this is now completely different. This is uh, inspiring when you were at a production or when you talked with a director or so. Some, so do you have such a moment to share? 
I don't, well, I don't know if there's one particular moment. I mean, I think it's it's a culmination of speaking to lots of people across the space um, who have been working in it. And I think it's it throws up uh, lots of questions about um, about about the filmmaking process. Um, you know, we've been uh, we we had this sort of um, mindset around the auteur, right? The the single creator, um, and we just had Cannes Film Festival, of course, and it, and and you know it celebrates that artistic vision. And I think you know what we you know from talking to people on the Mandalorian to working with the um, the, the garden studios in some of their early virtual productions it really um it's really apparent that it's no the, the way this is heading is that it's it's no longer about you know the author it's about the creative team um and that is that is very exciting but it does you know it, throw, it throws up all of these you know challenges around uh, around that workflow um but as you know, Johannes and Jamie were saying, there's there's all these tools now which make that collaboration possible. So you can have your all of your um, creative team look, diving into the real time environment on their iPads um, and collaborating in that way. You know, deciding actually, no, look, you know, this set would be better this way I, I you know because i i you know cinematographer i would like to shoot it this way um so we don't need to have we don't need to have such a you know a detail in that space for example um yeah the, the, yeah the visualization you showed um suggested uh, even an iterative process so i know that from virtual reality production we often uh, really start with uh with a prototype and work our way up but actually right from the start you're in a very rough you have a very uh, rough prototype of what the final environment will be, unlike in film production where you first write an expose and you're talking a lot about visual things. We get visually very quick. Have you observed this kind of, of visual communication uh, in, in the process, the development? Uh, that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I, think, I think that is where it's, it's heading. I think at the moment it's still, um, sort of you know there's not a pure it's, it's not it's not purists still there's no yeah. you know it's still um you know the, the mandalorian they still had to do you know you know it wasn't it wasn't a complete virtual production pipeline and that's held up as the you know the the main you know example of it so it, it is being figured out but all of these tools are so you know i i think as you know the, the guys mentioned as well you know you had this glamour of the LED stage and the LED wall and all of the exciting magical things that can happen there, but it's it's a collaboration before that point, um, which is can be can be used for any production um, in terms of the you know your design. In fact, you know you may well decide um, it may well become apparent, but when you've gone through that process, it's actually. It's, it's much better to do a physical location for this for this shoot. Um, so it, it's it's um, it's very it's all, all of these things are being worked out. But yeah, the the the, the guys might have um, other yeah. examples. So um, maybe we have a very concrete question to Johannes. We've talked about that uh, people from the visual department, so they like um, Jamie said that the post was moved to pre and. Uh, yeah, people who are far away in the production process suddenly start talking to each other. And yeah. um, additionally, the question uh, to Johannes, you can add to that. And then there was the question, what about the sound actually? So now we talk about visuals, but what, what role does the sound play in virtual mm -hmm. production on site? Yeah, I mean, um, to answer those two questions separately, like, um, Part of, part of the production being moved from um, post to earlier in the production is definitely, I think, like one of the large appeals of this. And I mean, that's something that um, Hollywood has been doing for like for, for years now with Previs, right? That is that is yeah. what Previs is, like um, reducing uh, complexity to start with. Um, 
figuring out what you want to do, making some of the things um, simply only possible that way. Um, but I think the interesting thing about that is that this like really becomes possible for everyone now. And then also other parts of your production, obviously um, with things like LED stages move um, to earlier in the production rather than post. Um, previous, I think, even though that's almost something that um, virtual production has grown beyond, I think it's also still important, especially for smaller studios, because previous, um, previously something that only large productions could do is now probably one of the easiest things you can do in virtual productions, because you don't need amazing assets, <laughs> you really can work with blocks if that's all you have, um, and you can produce them really from your home office if, if required, um, and still really make use of them and provide later stages of your uh, production that might or might not be virtual uh, with incredible value. And yeah, and then the sound question is a good question. Um, that is something that is um, really important. We've learned that by the fact that the initial prototype of Dragonfly um, wasn't able to interact with sound. And um, that is something that people noticed and that like is, disruptive because sometimes you really use sound um, as um, cues, for example, as ways of orienting yourself in within the action when you're doing cinematography. But um, I think that is something that you can take care of just by thinking of your order of operations um, by recording um, sound early. Uh, you then can use it as a reference. Um, obviously, fairly quickly, we made a change to um, support sound. We're now just using Unreal, for example, if we're working in Unreal, we're just using Unreal Sequencer. And in Sequencer, you can play sounds, you can even play effects, you can basically do whatever you want. And all of those things are then also visible or audit audible uh, when you're doing the actual shoot. Um, yeah, but, but good question, yeah. sounds really important. Um, there uh, was a question by Christian. What about data transmission for editing? Possibility to make last minute changes to background and post. So now that we heard, okay, now the um, final picture, we see the final picture when shooting again, uh, like it was in the old days. Um, so now are we then, is then everything locked or what, what do we do in post? Is there still things, the, the possibility to fix things in post? Maybe that's a question. Uh, to Jamie. Yeah, um, the general principle of in-camera VFX is that the idea is that you do walk away with the final shot um, and at the moment as it's captured um, it isn't capturing in uh, layers. There are people experimenting with that. There are people also experimenting with having green frustums which is the sort of the, the camera's POV that's drawn on the LED wall and they're, they're getting takes like that. So, you know, as a backup, if they do want to go down the traditional VFX route. But one thing I, I've noticed, I've produced like an automotive commercial, for example, um, it, we, we ended up shooting later in the overall process. So if you have, you know, four months, three, four months to turn around a commercial from everything from script to you know, getting stakeholders, getting signed off, green light money to delivering the, the uh, final film, the actual shoot would have taken place maybe at the midpoint, um, you know, of that those say three month period. It, we ended up shooting, you know, much closer down the line, um, a few weeks before release, because actually we were just doing all the post first. Um, that sort of discipline was actually quite good, because there's things like getting car assets from uh, companies where, quite frankly, it'll take as long as you give them. To do it and it will always come the day before you need it um so sometimes having that added pressure and just bringing it a little further forward um can be helpful but in in general yeah it's trying to get out of that fix it in post mentality and really fix it in prep um but as i say there, there are teams that are sort of um, doing both um and there's technological developments yeah. those sort of last bit of that you're, you're fading a bit, your, your audio connection is not so oh, good, but, but I think we, we got most of it. Um, it. It also sounds, maybe Alex can add to that as if, uh, uh, so now um, actually uh, on the one hand, it gives you a lot of freedom, this, this set. So uh, because you don't have fixed VFX views, you don't have fixed shots, but you can uh, decide on the, on the shot and the perspectives right on spot. 
But then again, you have uh, a lot of diligent planning uh, before to have this freedom on site. You have to plan well ahead. So it's um, it's not like it's it makes everything easier, but uh, the, the work goes somewhere else. It sounds like that. Yeah, I think I think that's it. I think it, you know, I mean, there are clearly a lot of new efficiencies, um, you know, particularly around the asset side of things and um, and communication. Um, these are exciting, but yeah, you're right. I mean, it has to, you know, you you are moving a lot of the work into into prep, um, and someone described that to me as pouring concrete. You know, you're you're stuck. Um, you know, potentially. Um, so that's why I think you know, Jamie. Jamie was saying some teams are are still. Um, I won't call it cheating, um, but they are. They're, 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 they're spreading their bets um, by having you know the, the green screen as well, so they have that have that option, and you can understand that. I, you know, you you wonder, you wonder that whether that's going to change the mentality. I mean, there's some directors who, uh, you know, quite understandably say, no, <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want to decide everything up front. I want to have that flexibility of, of changing things. Um, I want to have the, the flexibility of, um, you know, being able to, 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 to change the visual effects. But I, I think the, you know, I think the, the thing was visual effects was pushed to the back and it was like, sort of into this space where you know you just get on with it and and they're not involved in the process and it's kind of detached and then now those that talent is is much more engaged and involved and i think that's that's only got to be a, a positive thing that's actually also one of the aspects that fascinates our students and vfx uh, with this process because they really play a role uh, on set and they have a really uh, intense conversation. I remember when we made some experiments with Unreal Engine, we, we were able to, to change the virtual set uh, in, in real time. So we had to add something to the set and we just could put it there and then just try that with the real set. So that was quite fascinating. Um, uh, Steve has a question, a follow up question to the sound, but uh, before uh, Diogo uh, made a question there if there's a shift in budgeting, uh, in project budgeting from post to pre-production in the way that you have the asset production and the pre-production. So actually the budget also shifts, is that, is that true? And um, now, well, it's probably, probably not so easy to say where, where the, well, talking about efficiency, maybe we can talk about efficiency a bit. Um, sometimes I hear the, hear the cost argument. So like uh, some uh, virtual production stage uh, advertised that they made uh, scenarios where they calculated a, an efficiency win of like 12% of the budget. You save 12% on average your budget for your production if you do it in virtual production. Well, that's... Um, probably hard to say but what would you say is there is there somewhere you save somewhere where you put more money um just from your feelings i was just going to say i think it depends on the production so yeah. for example you know i'm based in london it's july isn't it? yeah um, it's uh, finally sunny if someone came to me and goes oh, i want to use an led wall because i'm going to shoot a film in a in a london park in the middle of summer i'd be like well you're insane doing it in virtual production there's a park down the road Go take your crew down there but um if if they want um they're having a long drawn out uh you know fight scene or something where they're going to be shooting complex performance and they want it to be magic hour in a forest or a yeah. desert you know and the cast are in london and they can't travel because of covid suddenly you start painting a picture where if you were to try and do that um, it might be impossible and you're probably going to end up shooting three hours a day because that's when you've got perfect lighting and suddenly the cost is going to balloon. So I think it does depend on your ambition and your team's, you know, uh, you know, location and things like that. So um, there's certainly in terms of doing like an automotive production um, in central London, we saved a lot of money on traveling cars around. Um, we definitely spent a lot of money on post-production in optimizing cars for real time, um, which maybe other CG teams would have been able to do 
faster um or, or not not faster but maybe more cost effectively unreal artists that you know even rough tricky to find um so uh yeah i think it just depends on the production is what i would say yeah yeah, definitely. I also heard that like shooting endlessly in the blue hour is, is definitely one of the perks of such a studio. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you really have to see. We um, maybe we can also talk about uh, the accessibility aspect. But uh, let's sneak in the follow-up question on sound. Uh, Steve says it's perhaps not the tech of sound generation and capture, but the effects on performances for actors and crew and mediation of sense uh, of events in space slash space place in now placing location recording as a post art or replacing. So it's, you say it's uh, right now, the art of sound is, is taking place in, uh, in post. So you see the scene you, you have. Uh, so actually that, that is an interesting aspect uh, yeah. because um, I also know that for example, film music, they say, no, I just, I don't want to know anything before. I just want to have, at least the rough cut uh, to, 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 to start uh, doing the music. And before, I don't need to know about the book or anything. Um, so maybe Johannes? Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's, I think that's a really valid ob observation. Um, obviously, like when we're shifting um, part of the work from, from post to prayer, then um, things like sound, like um, figuring out what the background exactly looks like is stuff that we're doing earlier in the process. And so in that sense, um, there is a disruption to how we do this. I think um, the confusion about this partly also comes from, I mean, besides good reason, it partially also comes from the way we're using, we were uh, used to doing things, right? This is how uh, movie production has been done for, for a while now. But if you think about it, um, it's, actually not that unnatural to figure out what your room looks like before you place an actor in it. That is exactly what you're doing if you are doing a physical shoot with a camera. So um, it's, it's not that absurd to figure the same thing out um, if you're doing a virtual shoot. And more to Steve's point, I think um, one, one benefit that also comes from that, and that in some instances actually is part of why there are small cost savings possible, is that now you're having a better awareness of where your actors actually are, what is happening around them, um, what things there are that they maybe should interact with. Um, and, and those are just really useful for the, for the actual shooting of your talents as well. Yeah. Uh, maybe Jamie, can you add concrete examples from from projects that Epic was involved in, wh how they dealt with the sound? Yeah, I think it's um, you know in the, in the projects we had, we didn't we kind of approached it. I suppose we you know we we just took captured sound on set of uh, performers and anything else that needed to be captured afterwards. We either used sound libraries or we did have a sound. Um, artists go out and capture some atmos of similar locations so it didn't feel too dissimilar from yeah. um, you know the how you'd approach a location shoot really um often you do try your best to get clean dialogue um and then approach separate things differently you know and also a lot of times there's things in the scene that you don't have access to cars are notoriously hard to capture sounds of robots don't exist often so you use different things. Um, so that's what we did. I have heard of some of the large volumes have issues with capturing um, dialogue in terms of echo, because you're essentially in a giant mm. uh, echo chamber. Um, but they have worked around that. You know, microphone technology is pretty awesome nowadays. Um, so yeah, it didn't feel, from my perspective, anything too different to what you do on a, a yeah. It it also uh, sounds quite obvious that for sound, you cannot uh, capture the full uh, soundscape, like the, the, the final mix in the studio, because uh, you have to have a separate uh, voice track, for example, and you have to do the mixing. So otherwise, uh, yeah, I think uh, that that's much more, would be much more complicated or well, that the, you, you have to have those separate tracks probably. But still it's interesting, how would it change uh, the performance of actors if you had the full uh, the, the full soundscape of the final movie around you and were immersed not just in the visual set but also in the sound and in the atmosphere. 
Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think it, it yeah. increases the workload uh, for sound designers capturing on set because there will be lots of things that won't be present yeah. go somewhere. But yeah, there's a, there's also opportunities as well to help the performance yeah. by triggering sounds. Going for the accessibility uh, topic, um, Fiona uh, asked, do you think companies will switch more from VFX to Unreal in the future? Is it feasible to use Unreal uh, in, in independent movies? And maybe to add to that, there's a question from Mariana Teixeira. She says, nowadays, uh, or asks whether there are any, uh, any animated film that is made with these tools. And I'd like to wrap this into also the question, um, what is the advantage of having the, the, the real time effects, especially in animation, when I saw the, the beta uh, uh, demo uh, animation, I thought, well, actually, you always, to, to, uh, for virtual production, you always have to have a full set. Uh, and for animation, you have very specific shot that maybe you can save a lot of work so that you don't have to uh, uh, model the full set, but just work with a part of it. So, well, uh, is it efficient and is it, um, well, feasible to use it in independent movies? Let's, let's start with Jamie because it was about Unreal, but then the others um, can help the add. Sure. Well, yeah, yes, really. Um, there are a lot, there are virtual productions, um, mostly the animation side of things, where there are very small teams making both shorts and features um, very successfully within Unreal Engine. There's some teething problems, we're not going to lie about that, but that's because most uh, off uh, traditional renders, uh, rendering and 3D pipelines have been around for a very, very long time. Um, and Unreal is playing a little bit of catch up there. Um, But yes, and generally the most efficient thing is you're starting to see smaller teams. Um, and that, that's exciting because some CG animation teams have been extremely large and it's quite nice to be able to have, see more efficient teams who can work faster. The render times are shorter. They don't have to use render farms. Um, so yeah, they very much are being used in the independent space and the high-end space uh, for both film and animation. I think at the moment, ICVFX has slightly more of a barrier just because of the LED wall technology that is slightly, at the moment, just a little bit harder to access, uh, but that is definitely changing too. Yeah. Um, yeah, Johannes, you want to add? <laughs> Yeah, I think like, especially if you're talking about um, fully animated content as well, that's really something where the complexity of virtual production is uh, significantly reduced because in, in that context, you, you, you're not uh, shooting live footage. So you can get rid of like your whole LED setup for, for a fully animated uh, segment and really just use Unreal and some form of virtual camera, for example, um, to, um, to, 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 produce um, the image that you're looking for. And there are, um, uh, like, like Jamie just said, there are a couple of really impressive examples of that already, uh, where there are case studies online that you um, can look at. And um, yeah, yeah, that's part of why this is exciting. And, and um, uh, some of these uh, productions really only use um, in Unreal rendering, which then of course is a like fairly efficient process of, of creating that image. Yeah. Alex? Yeah, like I think it's, it's, it's really exciting for independent film. Um, I think, you know, it, it's, it, it's important not to sort of be, um, to think this is an all or nothing, I've got to either do a virtual production or, or regular production. There's stuff which you can just use um, and become familiar with. You know, just for example, you know, instead of having a, uh, or as well as having a mood board or, uh, you know, your, your um, treatment, having the, your vision of the movie laid out in, in previous to approach finances, I think is really interesting. You know, this shows, This, you know, in terms of risk mitigation, uh, you know, this is this is the vision we have. This is, you know, how the shots are going to look. Um, you know, I mean, it may be making the whole thing might be a bit extreme, but that would be, but it would be, you know, that is that is one option you to go. It's just like, let, let, let's visualize the whole movie um, and let's unlock, you know, un, you know, de-risk the financing um, of this of this project. Um, 
and then yeah, on, on the animation stuff, I've posted a couple of things in the chat. Um, there's a filmmaker called Has Dalal who started out in in, in live action, has moved moved into the animation space um, using Unreal because it just affords him all this freedom, you know, creative freedom, um, working with a with a global team of of you know of, of collaborators, um, and. And I, and I said I shared another one as well. It's really, you know, I think this the animated space is really exciting, um, just because it is the barriers are so much lower. Yeah. So uh, the I think well, uh, we we started like ten minutes late, so uh, I think it's okay if we do like five more minutes. I have two questions which are a bit more uh, um, uh, at the. Uh, a bit more off topic that I would still like to address. And uh, one follow up question for, for Jamie. Uh, could you tell um, how precise, well, yeah, a bit more in depth, how, how it helps to reduce the team size? So uh, which, which jobs actually uh, are, are concerned here? So do you need less modelers, animators, or where, where, uh, where's the, uh, when you compare the teams, where where can you reduce the team? Where do the teams get slimmer? I th I think they're slimming down evenly from my experience. I don't think yeah. there's a particular department that's um, that is sort of being taken out of the equation equation when you think of animation because um, you know rigging, modeling, it's all still there. Lighting, they're just getting to see results faster, which means they get feedback rounds faster which means they get to do their next versions faster, which means the whole pipeline just moves quicker. And when you, traditionally, when you have a, you want things to go quicker uh, and you, there's a finite amount of time to render it, to see it, the way you get around that is you add more bodies. So the work's getting done faster. So um, the mandates go up. Um, so I think it's just simply that they're getting to see more accurate results quicker but the teams are getting to work faster. So therefore you have a smaller team. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it doesn't, I don't see it as a disruptive technology that's going to really change things, you know, in, in any sort of labor way. It's just that, you know, the, the days of a two, 300 man feature film probably should be challenged so we can get more, more content in a more agile way out the door. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Jonah has, uh, um, Jonah, uh, Joanna asks more and more video narrative video games are coming out and the line between them and films or TV shows is extremely blurred. Do you think they deserve a spot at film awards or will they in the future? And this question is also about, so is there something, is, 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 is there a convergence? Is there uh, a medium in between film and, and game or what's happening at this intersection? from your observations? Um, yeah, so I think it's awesome. the most recent thing that's quite interesting to note is, uh, you know, Netflix say their biggest competitors Fortnite because they are competing for uh, people's attention and what they choose to do on their evenings for entertainment. Um, and that's led for Netflix to move into the gaming space. Um, so I think, yeah, I think there's a really exciting crossover. I don't think, I think games always be games and films always be films, but there will be a blurred area both in production methods and the experience um and i think it's quite an exciting time to be honest yeah i think that's like a really interesting topping as well because i mean i think for a while um these two um two worlds ran in parallel basically the traditional game engine world uh, or games world creating cinematography with game engines obviously and having been doing that for a while. And then like the film world starting to use these tools as well and building um, tools atop of this technology that really makes it more efficient to use as a cinematography tool. Um, so for example, doing uh, cinematography with a VCAM uh, is obviously much more efficient than trying to animate a camera path by hand. It's like, you, yeah. you can just, do so much more cinematography in a short amount of time comparatively. And I think for a while, um, the games world didn't really seem to pick up steam on, on, on that improvement to what could be also their workflow. But I think recently they've become more aware and yeah, there are interesting things ahead, I believe. 
Uh, Gonzalo has a question. Uh, from... Sorry, Dion, can I just add something there? I mean, uh, I think, okay, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, no, this is this is really exciting. I think I think this is this is where things are going. I think it's um because uh, we're moving into a, you know I, th I think being a storyteller in today's world, being a production company, it's it's important to think you know across across platform across media. Um, it's about story and how that can travel and when you have the the same tools being used to make a game being used to make a film a series you know that's that opens up a lot of possibilities right about how characters can travel across platforms how stories yeah. can weave across platforms um and i think that's that to me is is very exciting and that's a big focus about what we try to push is that you know that creative exchange maybe uh then we have a good final question which uh, poses the question so how how do i actually start what what is my next step um gonzalo um asks uh, from the independent low production uh low budget production view would they simply rent a virtual studio how much much would that cost right now just to have an idea of course that depends on the technology you use but uh from the low production so like from the accessibility uh perspective um maybe each one of you give uh a rec would you give a recommendation so what how how should you start so what are ideas to get into uh virtual production um maybe on a shoestring but in any case quickly um johannes yeah so i would recommend just downloading uh, unreal engine is a, it's a great place to start and then obviously our recommendation is to um like also add uh, dragonfly to the mix um just because it makes um set up for your virtual cinematography so so easy and like will allow you to start shooting actual footage um within minutes probably um the unreal engine is obviously free um uh, dragonfly comes with a cost but it's fairly um, low cost in terms of uh, cinematography tools um also there's a free trial that you can take out to play with the uh, around with it completely risk-free and then in if you're in the educational space we're also offering um like steep discounts to make that even more accessible jamie yeah, I think um, I'd, I'd say, especially from an ind if you're interested in independent film, check out uh, people like Haz, who was mentioned, and Matt Workman. Um, these are sort of non-epic evangelists, and obviously I'll be biased and say uh, checking out Unreal Engine. All the learning resources on the learning portal are free. Um, there's also, for any established VFX artist, there's lots of things like the fellowship um, and other schemes and boot camps that are run for free. Um, so there's tons of training material out there. I think if you're interested in camera VFX and virtual production, get to grips with a game engine, um, real-time technologies first, and then you'll start to seem to understand. But a lot of the, the big YouTubers out there in VP, a lot of them are making bedroom setups to get their head around it and start making stuff. So yeah, just get your head into those resources. Yeah, and Alex? I think that's all that's all great advice. Um, and of course, I'd just add to check out futureoffilm.live um, with lots of resources, podcasts, reports, um, lots of information there for you to dig into and uh, explore. Yeah. And uh, talking about studios, so there, there, we saw there's a range of options for virtual production. It, it starts with a simple iPad where you can just uh, shoot an animation movie in the virtual world. Then uh, you can go to green screen options. So there are small studios which work, which work with a combination of, for example, green screen or motion capture, which is also pretty accessible, also in, in terms of cost. And um, of course, um, there are LED studios. The LED stages, of course, are the most expensive and might not be uh, a viable choice for independent productions. But Right now, uh, we are in a um, in in a time where uh, one or other where, where sometimes the studios that establish or the stages that are established 
uh, are up for experiments. So if you have an interesting case, just bring it up to them. If you have an interesting project that poses an interesting challenge, sometimes you might get lucky that they partner up with you and you get a better deal. So just try. It's still like uh, the gold rush uh, <laughs> or the pioneer spirit. And um, that can bring you a good idea sometimes, or Tailand can, can bring you also uh, a long way. Um, yeah, I saw that also the, all the links have been posted. Uh, the next session will be at 3 p.m., blockchain, blockchain, a giant leap for the film industry. That question will be fully answered tonight, uh, <laughs> this afternoon. Um, and uh, until then, uh, I thank you a lot, Johannes, Alex, and Jamie, for your time. Um, the people uh, from the Fest Festival um, also thank you a lot for, for arranging the slot and giving me the nice opportunity to chair the session. And uh, I hope you had a good time and thanks for the inspiring talks and discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good day.